this is JJ Weller with the Share God's Hope podcast, and today we're going to talk about four bad excuses for neglecting world missions and evangelism. Hey, welcome to the second episode. Thanks so much for joining Share God's Hope podcast as a production of Message Ministries and Missions. We're an evangelical organization dedicated to reaching the unreached and teaching the reached to do likewise. Today we have a thrilling, challenging, convicting show on four bad excuses for neglecting world missions. If you're a sincere believer, you don't only want to know what Jesus says, but you want to follow through and do it. And Jesus gave every one of us a clear calling. In Mark 16, 15, he said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to the whole creation. The early church took this command to heart. We read in the book of the Acts, in the book of Acts, that they spread the gospel everywhere that they could. But the modern church hasn't shown the same radical zeal that we read in the book of Acts. In fact, to this day, 51% of believers don't know what the Great Commission is, according to Barna. And in the 2019 study, it was found that only 45% of churchgoers had shared their faith within a six-month period. That means that over half of believers had not shared their faith one time in six months. Friends, the Great Commission is the most urgent thing in existence today. Because if we don't fulfill the Great Commission, souls will be lost forever. There is nothing more important. So we have to ask, what is keeping us? from fulfilling our heavenly calling, our heavenly mandate to preach the gospel in America and all around the world. And it gets down to this, excuses. If we know that we're supposed to do something, but we're not doing it, then why aren't we doing it? We're making an excuse. And today I want us to cover four really common excuses for evangelistic negligence. And I want you to open up your heart And to graciously consider if you have believed any of these excuses, if you've made these excuses your own. And if so, then come to God, receive his grace, turn from that excuse and receive your call all over again because the harvest is great, but the laborers are few. So let's check out excuse number one. I bet you've heard this one before. I'm not called. Have you ever said that? I'm not called. Have you ever heard someone say this? I don't feel led. You know, it's a funny story. There was a pastor who was tired of hearing people say, I don't feel led. So one day he came to church and he brought a piece of lead in his pocket. He had the congregation pass it around. And he said to everyone, go ahead, feel it really nicely. Get it, get it a feel for its texture, that that piece of lead. And then once it come back to him, he said, okay, listen, I never want to hear again that you said, I didn't feel led. Now you felt led. Now here's the truth. That's a funny story, but we don't need to feel a piece of lead to feel led to preach the gospel because we are called to preach the gospel. Jesus said it clearly in Mark 16 and 15, the verse that we read before. But today, millions of professing Christians flat out deny their call to evangelism and world missions. And we can see this really clearly in a 2018 Barna poll. The Barna group surveyed 1,714 professing Christians who had discussed their faith at least once in the last five years, okay? And of that sample, listen to this, only 64% believed that every Christian has a responsibility to evangelize. So what does that mean? One third of those who had preached the gospel or shared about their faith in some way in the last five years claimed that they didn't have any responsibility to evangelize. They denied that there was a mandate on their lives to preach the gospel individually. How have so many missed their evangelistic calling? The study reveals one major reason. 29%, which is almost the exact uh, amount of people who denied their evangelistic calling, 29% of those surveyed believed that evangelism is the duty of the local church, meaning the leaders, the teachers, the preachers, not the individual Christian. So they believed that if they want to see their friend saved, come to the Lord, It's not their duty to preach the gospel. It's their duty to bring the person to church so that someone else can preach the gospel. Friend, there's a big problem with this. New Christians are called sheep, right? Christians are called sheep. Pastors are called shepherds. Have you ever heard in your whole life of a shepherd giving birth to a sheep? 
It doesn't work that way. Sheep give birth to sheep. And that's why Jesus calls every believer, go into all the world and preach the gospel to the whole creation. We can't believe this age-old lie that has locked the lips of modern Christians. So many are saying, evangelism is for the pulpit, and I'm from the pew. No, friend, your life is a pulpit. Even if you're sitting in the pew, you're called to preach the gospel. Once again, in Mark 16, 15, Jesus imparted a bold calling to every single believer, you included, my dear friend. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. And maybe you say, I don't think that I have the power to fulfill that call. Well, that excuse is left as well because in Acts 1, 8, he promises to give you the power that you're going to need to fulfill this call. He said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. Who received that Pentecostal power to be witnesses to the ends of the earth? Not just the apostles, my dear friends. Every believer received the power to be a witness for Jesus Christ. And the everyday disciples of the early church didn't exclude themselves from the Great Commission. But Acts 4.31 gives us a peek into what the early church looked like. It said that they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Oh, for a church like that today, for a church on the move, for a church in mission, for a church that is filled with the Holy Spirit and speaks the word of God boldly. Oh, Lord, fill me with the power to speak your word boldly. Fill my listeners with the power to speak your word boldly. That is God's will for our lives, my dear friends. And it's time to set that church, that church in motion again. We desperately need to acknowledge and obey our heavenly calling but so many have denied it. I want to share a really challenging quote. Many of you have probably heard it from an amazing evangelist of history named William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army. William Booth, if you read his writings, there's one thing that he could not stand, and that was lazy Christians, like you and I sometimes can be, let's be honest. And so he just dealt it straight so often. Same with his wife, Catherine Booth. And his words still ring so powerfully over a century later. Let's listen to what he said to those who said that they weren't called to preach the gospel. Not called, did you say? Not heard the call, I think you should say. Put your ear down to the Bible and hear him bid you go and pull sinners out of the fire of sin. Put your ear down to the burdened, agonized heart of humanity and listen to its pitiful wail for help. Go, stand by the gates of hell. And hear the damned entreat you to go to their father's house and bid their brothers and sisters and servants and masters not to come there. Then look Christ in the face, whose mercy you have professed to obey, and tell him whether you will join heart and soul and body and circumstances in the march to publish his mercy to the world. Oh, friends, it is time for us to publish his mercy to the world. We're all called to win the lost for Christ and to reach the nations by going, giving, praying, or sending. So the only question that's left is, will we say yes or no? As William Booth asked, will we look Christ in the face whose mercy we have professed to obey and tell him no? Or will we look Christ in the face whose mercy we profess to obey and tell him, yes, here I am, Lord, send me, I will Go. It's time to put away all the excuses because Jesus is calling each of us and saying, as he said to the disciples, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. All right, let's get to the next excuse. This excuse says, I don't have the time. Have you ever made that excuse? Because I certainly have. In fact, I probably made this excuse this week. Lord, help us. Help us. Right? We need his grace. You see, so many people acknowledge their heavenly calling, but excuse themselves by their busy schedules. They look at their calendar, they look at their to-do list, and they see that evangelism is one of those things on the list, but they look at everything else and they say, ah, these other things are going to have to come first. And this is actually proven statistically. A 2014 survey reveals that almost half of professing Christians live spiritually stunted by their to-do list. So the Evangelical Alliance conducted this survey, and of 42% of those that they surveyed, they said that they struggled to find time to pray and study the Bible. Now, here's my question. Prayer and Bible study are for the benefit and the fruitfulness of the believer, right? Jesus said, 
abide in me and I in you and you'll bear much fruit. And he warned that if we don't bear, if we don't abide in him, then we're not going to bear any fruit. And eventually we're going to shrivel up and be cast into the fire. So reading the word and spending time in prayer is for our own benefit. We're releasing burdens. We're receiving God's comfort, receiving God's instruction. But evangelism is for the benefit of others. And furthermore, prayer and Bible study is oftentimes very comforting, whereas evangelism is often very difficult and it can be a self-denial at times. In fact, even Charles Spurgeon, one of the greatest evangelists in history, called it an irksome or extremely difficult task. So if we struggle to find time to receive comfort and release burdens through prayer and Bible study, how much harder to take on Jesus' burdens and suffer ridicule through biblical evangelism? You see, whether we say it out loud or not, a lot of us believe that we don't have the time to share the good news. We're caught up in so many things. So many things seem more urgent. It could be our work. We have a work project that we're so consumed by that we just forget about the people around us. It could be if you're in school, an exam that's coming up and you just want to get the perfect grade, you're spending so much time that you forget to love your neighbor. Or like recently in 2020, the impeachment trial, all these political issues, we get sucked up in these things so much that we forget about God's eternal kingdom and his mandate for us to preach the gospel to our neighbor. But we have to be honest with ourselves. Nothing is more urgent than our neighbor's eternal destinies. Your friends, your family will inhabit one of two places for all of eternity. They're either going to inhabit heaven and be with God in his glorious presence forever, or they're going to be in hell, experiencing the suffering of guilt and shame for eternity. Dear friends, nothing is more urgent because all the people that we know, they could literally die at any moment. We say we don't have the time to evangelize. What a tragedy, because I've lost count of the amount of people that I know knew that died before the age of 25, suddenly. Not a single one of them had a warning. Every single one of these friends who died before the age of 25 died suddenly. And so what did it teach me? It taught me, not that I've always followed it like I should, it taught me that evangelism is incredibly urgent because you never know when someone is going to pass and stand before the throne of God to give an account for their lives. And there's only one source of salvation. It's the blood of Jesus Christ. And there's only one way to receive that salvation. It's to believe in the blood of Jesus Christ and to follow Christ as your Lord. And you cannot do that until someone comes and clearly preaches the gospel to you. Hello? Nothing is more urgent than that we begin to follow God's command to preach the gospel to our neighbor. Because if we don't have time to snatch our beloved neighbors from the flames of hell, for one, maybe we don't love our neighbor. And secondly, if that's the case, then our priorities are desperately, desperately, desperately out of rank, dear friends. And I'm not saying this to condemn anyone, but so that we can wake up to the reality and so that God's grace can propel us into a life of natural witness to our neighbors, that we can begin to testify of what Jesus Christ has done to save the world from sin and the judgment that comes for sin. It is high time. It is urgent. Now, and here's another question. Really, this I don't have the time excuse. How often is this really true that we don't have the time? The fact is that we waste our time, my friends. And I'm not just talking to you. I have wasted plenty of time. I have to say, if you don't have time to evangelize, where did you get the time to listen to this podcast? <laughs> now, I welcome you. I ask that you continue to listen to the podcast because it's going to give you a boost and encouragement to go and share your faith with your neighbors and to be a witness with your life. But we have to get rid of this excuse. It doesn't make any sense. We have time, but we're spending time on Facebook or we're spending time playing video games for many people or on YouTube, whatever it might be. We need to begin to set apart some time to share the word of Jesus with our neighbors and our friends and our families. Even if that just means instead of sitting around on YouTube that we arrange a night to go hang out with a friend and someone who doesn't know the Lord, and that we pray for the Lord to open up the door for us to, to begin to share about what Jesus Christ did on the cross, to really introduce someone to Jesus Christ. See, the biblical authors are always realists. They never deny the realities of life, and that's why Paul gives us 
a radical command. He said, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time, time, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. That's in Ephesians 5, 15 through 16. The days themselves are evil, so make the most of your time, Paul tells you. The Greek word here translated make the most and make the most of your time is exagoraso, and it's a financial term. We're all really careful with our money, right? And here Paul knows that, and he's comparing our time with our money so that we'll be careful with our time. What does this Greek word mean? It means to buy up, to rescue from loss, or to redeem by payment of a price to recover from the power of another. So look at it this way. Another power, the kingdom of darkness, has come in alliance to steal your time and my time from the thing that matters most, from the thing that's going to have the greatest eternal impact, the Great Commission. The kingdom of darkness, through excuses and through lies and through distractions, has taken power of our time, stolen our time from the Great Commission. Jesus is calling us to rescue that time from loss. And if we don't, Paul calls us unwise men because he says, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. You see, I I think that we need to get back to some of the mindset of William Booth and other revivalists of history who they didn't see, they didn't believe in this in-between spot that we believe in. See, we tend to believe in wise men, unwise men, and middle wise men. We tend to believe in righteous men and women, unrighteous men and women, and middle righteous men and women. But in the Bible, it teaches that there are the righteous and the unrighteous. It teaches that there are the wise and the unwise. So the question is, what category do you and I fall into? Are we wise with our time or foolish with our time? Are we throwing it away or are we putting it into God's use with the wisdom that is provided by the grace of God in Jesus Christ. I want to read a stirring quote from an incredible author named Samuel L. Brangle. He was a part of the Salvation Army, and you're going to want to check out his books if you can. This is from The Soul Winner Secret, which is one of his most popular books. And as you read this, you and I, let's consider our lives. Let's consider, are we living in a foolish way or in a wise way in how we're handling our time? Listen to this incredibly stirring quote. The difference between wise and foolish folks, rich and poor, saints and sinners, redeemed and unredeemed, does not usually result so much from different circumstances and the start they had in life as it does from the difference in the use of their time. One used it purposefully, while the other squandered it. One was a miser of minutes. The other was a spendthrift of days and months and years. One was always active, packing into every hour some search for truth, prayer to God, communion with Jesus, service to others, counsel to a saint, and warning or entreaty to wandery souls, while the other was neglecting the opportunity of the present, but full of vague dreams for an ever-receding, elusive future. The one plods patiently and surely to glory, honor, peace, immortality, and eternal life, as the other drifts dreamily but certainly into the regions of indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish, Romans 2, 8 through 9, KGV, and finally lands in hell. Wow. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that if someone neglects evangelism for a season of their lives, that they're lost. But this is an incredibly stirring quote. Are we packing into every hour some search for truth, prayer to God, communion with Jesus, service to others, counsel to a saint, and warning or entreaty to wandering souls? Or are we neglecting the opportunity of the present, but full of vague dreams for an ever-receding, elusive future? Maybe we have dreams to one day enter into missions, or maybe we have dreams to one day be a faithful evangelist, a faithful witness for Jesus, but our dreams honestly aren't what counts. The Bible doesn't say that we're going to be judged according to our dreams, but according to our deeds, what we do with our lives. So this is a question. Do you say that you fully surrendered to Christ? Then it's time. Really, consider what is stealing your time from God's eternal call. What's keeping you from from opening up your mouth and sharing the gospel with your neighbor? You and I need to make the necessary changes lest we end our life in regret for our spiritual negligence. As C.T. Studd said, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ shall last. So at the end of our life, 
what will last? What will we have that we've done for Christ? At the end of our life, we're not going to get a reward for minutes spent watching YouTube, reading Twitter, Facebook, reading novels, playing games. All those things are going to fade away. We need to be careful with how much time we're spending on these and put our time to something that's going to last for eternity. Or yes, on the day of judgment, at the judgment seat of Christ, though we be saved through fire, we're going to realize that we were saved through fire, that we had no eternal rewards, and that we hardly have a crown to throw at the feet of Jesus in glory and worship. So let's go to the next excuse, which is that I don't have the money. How many of us have said this one? God calls us to give our money to world missions or to to share it with a friend who's in need, who doesn't know the Lord or in, in, in money in general. And we say, Lord, uh, I don't think I have the money. Now, we all know what it's like to struggle in finances. But unfortunately, many modern Christians use their financial struggles as an excuse to neglect world missions. Now, listen to this stat. This is by CDF Capital. Only 5% of professing Christians give 10% or more of their income to Christian causes at all. 5%. Oh my gosh. And when you realize that almost half of the world, I think that the statistic is 41.2% of the world's population hasn't even heard about Jesus Christ, and they won't hear it until we send people, which costs money. And then you see that only 5% of professed Christians are giving 10% or more of their income to Christian causes at all. Even worse, of this meager amount, only 6.4% of donations actually support mission efforts abroad, and only 1.3% go to unreached and unevangelized people groups. Pennies, pennies are going to those who have never heard about Jesus Christ. Oh, dear friends, I'm sorry. This excuse hurts me more than any of the others. Because if we neglect to preach the gospel in the United States, there's a million Christians that technically could, honestly, probably won't, but they could come up and preach the gospel to our friend or our neighbor or our family member, or they could find it on TV, they could read a book, Oh, my my dear friends in the 1040 window among the unreached, if we don't send someone, they're not going to hear. Most people in 1040 window don't know a Christian. In a lot of these nations, there is no gospel on the TV. They don't have gospel literature. A lot of them can't even read if you gave them gospel literature, dear friend. And so this excuse, I'm sorry, oh, it's criminal. It is criminal. Here's the truth. This is from the traveling team. Evangelical Christians could plant a church in every unreached people group. Every unreached people group with only 0.03% of their income. 0.03%. According to the traveling team, the church has roughly 3,000 times the financial resources and 9,000 times the manpower needed to finish the Great Commission. I don't believe the excuse that we don't have the money because the truth is we have 3,000 times the money we need, but we're not sending it. We're sending pennies on the dollar. Friends, when are we going to learn to sacrifice? When are we going to learn that our finances don't belong to ourselves? We've come so far. I was reading yesterday in my volume of, uh, of John Wesley's works, and he had such a radical idea about money. In fact, as I read it, I was even asking is John Wesley going too far in the things that he's saying? But I would rather have the radical financial approach of John Wesley than the lackadaisical approach of the modern church any day who's hardly giving anything to those who need it most. And in fact, one of the biggest reasons why the modern church, quote unquote, doesn't have the money is because we're misallocating funds. We're putting money towards paying our staff and paying the AC and getting cold or hot water for our sinks in a church or getting theater style seating in our sanctuaries at the expense of unreached souls so that we can sit comfortably on Sunday. These people don't get to have a Sunday. And I sound strong when I'm saying this, but it's so important that we realize what we're doing, dear friends, so that we can repent and receive God's grace and start a new pattern that we can pass on to our children. Let's think about some words from the late Billy Graham. The late Billy Graham said something that ought to make each of us pause and reflect. 
He said, give me five minutes with a person's checkbook and I'll tell you where their heart is. And here's the truth, friends. We have to realize it. I'm not saying it in a condemning way. I say it in a gracious way so that God's grace can propel us to be responsible. But God will review our checkbooks at the end of days. We will give an account for every careless word that we speak, as Jesus said in Matthew 12, 36, ESV. And that includes the idle purchases that we make while excusing and saying that we don't have money to give to world missions, to those who need to hear the gospel. Friends, in that day, we're going, if we're saved, we're going to lose rewards. We're going to lose eternal rewards. But honestly, what's the big deal about rewards? Do you know what's the worst thing? It's not that we're going to lose reward tomorrow. It's that God's going to lose honor in our lives today. We're going to realize in that moment that God had called us to honor him with our lives, and we did not. And I think that the realization of that will cost much more than us not receiving eternal rewards. So in those moments, what will we see? Will we see that we lived with an open mouth and closed hands? Will Jesus identify creature comforts that we could have foregone to support God's mission and to save sinners from hell's dark clasp? We're not going to have any time then to change our spending habits. We're not going to have any opportunity anymore to give to the unreached. So friends, with urgency, let's repent of our stinginess. And now maybe someone listening today is discouraged about your finances because you want to give and you have a new heart that is generous by God's grace. But you feel that God wouldn't value your giving because you can't afford to give as much as others. Now, be incredibly encouraged because God's heart is so generous. He's not looking to judge or to condemn. He's looking to reward the good that he has caused to come through our hearts and through our hands. You see, what pleases God is not the amount of money that you give in comparison to others, but the generosity, the ample generosity of your heart. Now, remember, oh, there's this amazing story in the Gospels, and it applies to so many things. It's literally about money, but I think that it just applies to all of life. In Mark 12, we see a poor woman who entered into the temple treasury, and a lot of rich people were coming, the chapter says, and putting large amounts into the temple treasury. And it almost seems like they're showing off. But Jesus wasn't impressed with any one of them. This poor woman came in who had almost no money. And what did she give? She gave everything that she had. I believe it was just two coins. And Jesus' heart burst with love for that woman. He said in Mark 12, 43, Truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all the contributors to the treasury, for they all put in out of their surplus, but she out of her poverty put in all she owned, all she had to live on. Friend, today, if you have little to give, then give generously of the little that you have. Because it means even more than the abundant riches given by people of wealth. Jesus values what you give. He loves you. He cares for you. You're the apple of his eye if you're a believer saved by his grace. You don't know how much he values and loves you and wants to reward you. And if you give generously, you don't have to worry that you're going to be penniless. Because remember, The God who owns all of the money in the universe is your father. And in Philippians 4.19, he gave you a promise that you can bank on. That's why Spurgeon called the Bible God's checkbook. And he wasn't a prosperity teacher, neither am I. Oh, but he knew that there were promises for us to take a hold of. Philippians 4.19 said, My God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. So what do we come to? We come to this fact. The excuse that we don't have the money is refuted by this wonderful fact that you don't need to fear generosity when God is your provider. You don't need to fear generosity when God is your provider. All right, well, now let's go on to the next excuse, which is that there's so much work left at home. Now, this one is incredibly tragic. And the fact is that I don't need to prove it with statistics because I've heard it myself over and over again. When you begin to speak about the needs of the foreign mission field, so many modern Christians deflect. They deflect. Well, how? By pointing to the needs that they see at home. But this falls on its face for at least two reasons. 
First, a lot of the people who say this aren't honest because they claim that they have so much concern for home, but they haven't preached the gospel in the last six months or the last year or the last five years or in their whole Christian life. And if you're so concerned about the needs of home, why haven't you preached the gospel to anyone? What are you doing to meet the needs at home if that's your excuse? The truth is that a lot of us, we're just addicted to comfort. We're just addicted to to Netflix and, and TV shows and all these comfortable things. So we use this excuse to stay seated comfortably on our couches at home. But even beyond that, this excuse is statistically baseless. Baseless. The needs at home are nothing, nothing in comparison to the needs in the 1040 window. Let me show you some stats so that you can really see the comparison. First, I'll talk about the United States. 98.5% of America's population has ample access to the gospel. 77.5% of, of United States citizens profess Christianity. Now, we know that a lot of those people aren't truly saved, aren't truly converted, but at least we know, since they profess Christianity, that they have plenty of access to the gospel if they want it. They could visit one of our almost 400,000 evangelical churches. They could turn on their TV to try to seek God's word. They could go on their shelf and read the Bible. They could turn on the radio and listen to the word. They could check it out on the internet. They could seek spiritual perspective through maybe their family has a pastor or through one of their Christian friends, Christian acquaintances. But in general, these folks avoid every gospel opportunity with a passion. They avoid the gospel. But how much of your tithe is going to reach them? This will shock you. 99.7% of your church offerings go to reach them over and over and over again. Like a farmer who picked his field once and then picked it over and over. Picked the the first two rows of his field and picked it over and over and over, but neglected the last eight rows of his farm. That's what we're doing. And that is a scandal. Because meanwhile, this will break your heart. 3.09 billion people have minimal or no access to the gospel in a region called the 1040 window. If you want to know what the 1040 window is, then check out our last episode. Friends, that's almost half the world's population. Almost half the world's population has almost no access to the gospel. Most of them have never clearly heard the gospel message. They might have heard Jesus' name, but the majority of them had not clearly heard a gospel presentation. Over 80% of the poorest of the poor live in the 1040 window. Over 80%. We talk about poverty in the USA. Friends, let's wake up by God's grace. Over 80% of the poorest of the poor live there in the 1040 window. They survive on less than a dollar a day. No one in the United States could survive on that. The person with the smallest house in the United States is richer than most of the world's population. That's just true. Most of the people in the 1040 window can't visit a neighborhood church because the unreached world has only one Christian missionary for every 216,300 people. One for every 216,300 people. Most can't watch the gospel on TV or the radio. And few ever receive gospel literature, and tons of them wouldn't be able to read it if you gave it to them. Most of them can't ask a Christian friend about Jesus because most don't know a Christian. How much of your offering goes to them? The church sends only 0.5% of its offerings and 3.3% of its missionaries to reach them. Why? Why? What a disorder. What injustice. It's injustice. Today, everyone is talking about social injustice, Economic adjustment just makes your head spin, all the things that people talk to you about. I'm going to tell you what I see. I see evangelistic injustice, and we need to get to gospel justice, preaching the gospel to those who've never heard, and spreading the gospel fairly, instead of putting all our missionaries to those who've already heard so many times. Will you and I be complicit in this great sin of our generation? I want to offer a quote from Oswald J. Smith. I wanted to challenge you and inspire you to radically change your approach to missions. He said, what would you do if you should see 10 men lifting a log and if nine were on one end and one on the other, where would you help? Why, on the end where the one was lifting, would you not? Need I say more? It is the foreign field that needs our help most. 
This, then, is the most important work of the hour, to finish the unfinished task. How shall they hear without a preacher or a missionary? And how shall they preach except they be sent? Unquote. Friends, it's time to adopt Paul's burning ambition. I love this verse in Romans 15, 20. This, needs, this verse needs to bring a new reformation in the church. Not just about what salvation means, but about what mission means, my friends. Paul said that his ambition was to preach the gospel. He said, it's always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known in Romans 15, 20. If you told Paul there's too many needs at home, that he would say to you, well, it has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ was not known. We claim to be such strict biblicists, dear friends. If we're strict biblicists, then why don't we adopt Paul's passion? To preach the gospel where Christ is not known, I'm tired of all the systematic theology books that we make and everything, and we're doing nothing for the unreached. What excuses? Why am I speaking so severely? Why am I speaking so strongly? Because souls are at stake. And it breaks my heart right now. Please, consider, consider. One side of this missions log has too many workers. It's time to lift the other end of the missions log in prayer finances, advocacy, and if God calls in person. And as you do, remember Jesus' mission's promise. Surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Matthew 28, 20. We quote that verse all the time, but we forget that Jesus said that in context of the Great Commission. As we go into all the world preaching the gospel, he will always be with us to the very end of the age. And of course, he's always with us no matter what. He was sharing that in the context of world missions. So let's return to our call. Let's put away the excuses. Let's take on the inspiring and challenging life of being a witness for Jesus Christ. Dear God, forgive us for our excuses. Forgive us for the times when you called us to go. And Lord, we made excuses for why we should stay. But Lord, we know that you're a gracious and a merciful, and a forgiving God. And Lord, we don't want to sit around and mope, remembering all the things that we did over and over again. Rather, Heavenly Father, we boldly receive your grace coming to your throne, Heavenly Father. We boldly believe in your love that was proven on the cross when you shed your blood for us. And we boldly remember that that love is not only for us, but for the whole world. In Jesus, we declare with Isaiah the prophet, here I am. Send me. Help us to be your witnesses. Open up doors for us this very day, this very week, to share about Jesus Christ in one way or another. And Lord, may our lives be beacons of salvation and hope from the throne of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thanks so much for joining us, friends. It's a pleasure to have you here with us. We pray that this podcast was a challenge, an encouragement, an inspiration for you to stir you up to good works that Jesus Christ has predestined for you to do, according to the book of Ephesians. Did this podcast challenge and encourage you? We want to encourage and challenge you to subscribe whatever podcast service you're listening to. Share the video on Facebook if you're following us on Facebook. And are you looking for opportunities to support world missions? We want to invite you to check out sharegodshope.com where you can learn all about the things that Mrs. Ministries is doing to reach the unreached around the world. And you can find opportunities to adopt missionaries in those areas Fully support their ministries from $100 to $150 a month. Excellent opportunities. Or you could join our monthly mission support program called Senders for $30 a month. You can support various needs on the world missions field, and we'll let you know every month what your money is accomplishing for God's purposes. Now, this podcast was based on an article called Four Bad Excuses for Neglecting World Missions. You can find that article at bit.ly slash four bad excuses. That's bit.ly slash four bad excuses. Well, thanks for listening, and God bless you as you share God's story. I'm Brian Weller with Message Ministries. Has this video inspired you? Do you think others need to hear this message? Please let us know you're watching. Like our video, leave a comment, subscribe to our channel, and be sure to click the notifications bell. 
And that way you'll also help others to see our content. And don't forget to check out our website, sharegodshope.com, where you can learn all about our missions work worldwide. God bless you as you share God's hope.